Hi. In our last webinar, um, which was avoiding monolith applications uh, with, with Axon, um, we talked about how to introduce Axon in a greenfield situation. And, and based on that webinar, I, I've got many questions of people that said, I've got an application already, I've got a big ball of mud, and is there a way to introduce Axon uh, in that situation? And the answer to that is not really that simple. It might be the case. Uh, it might be that you've got your big ball of mud um, and you're stuck with it until you do a full rebuild. But let's go with the happy flow for now. Let's assume that you've got this, um, uh, this architecture and this is the, uh, the layered architecture which is a, a dominant uh, architectural style in, uh, seen in many, many applications nowadays. And in that um, architecture, on the right, you see the domain model. And that domain model is uh, depended on by almost every other layer there is. And it has a, a, a key, um, key position in, in making or breaking the big ball of mud. And this domain model, it usually starts off really simple in, in any application. Uh, so in the start, uh, it's a very simple domain model. Everybody understands it and it's really obvious uh, as to what it is. Uh, what its role is. Uh, when time progresses, the domain model evolves and quickly becomes this huge, uh, quite often entangled model where a lot of entities depend on other entities. And very often it's the case that having this very large and complex domain model, you end up with the big ball of mud. And of course, we all know that the, uh, the big ball on this sheet isn't mud, but it is reality. So what is Axon uh, before we move on? Uh, Axon is a CQRS framework for Java. It helps developers build um, applications using the uh, CQRS architectural style. It's an open source uh, framework uh, under the Apache 2 license, which means you can download it and use it for free. Uh, you have access to the source code and you can use it for anything you like. It provides you with uh, a lot of the very common building blocks that you have in CQRS and event-driven architectures, such as a, 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 the event bus, and it allows you to build event handlers and uh, process everything asynchronously if you want to. But more importantly, is Axon promotes the isolation of application components, so it allows you to build an application in a monolithic way without having to fear that you're stuck with a monolith forever. You can break it down into components as you like because of this isolation. So as long as you use the, um, um, the Axon uh, APIs properly, you can scale and break, out, break up your application into a, a distributed application if you want to without any pain. It's, it's very message oriented, so there's a lot of messaging going on in, in Axon, mainly in the events and commands. Um, and it's location transparency is key. Um, as I said, the components um, are, you can build them in a monolithic way and, and spread them out later. That's because of the location transparency that's uh, very obvious in all, all of Axon's APIs. So we do that by separating your infrastructure from your business logic. And the business logic components, they interact with each other in a location transparent way, which means they don't care where the other uh, components are located. They might be in the same JVM, they might be on different machines, they might be on different data centers around the world. Um, the APIs don't change. Um, and of course, it's highly customizable because we don't want, want you to match your infrastructure to the framework but we wanted to do the other way around. We want to make sure that whatever infrastructure that you have or you need for your application, uh, you can uh, configure it, uh, you can configure Axon Framework to work with it. So back to our main question is, given an application, how do I break, break it apart into different modules and then apply the features that Axon Framework provides? Um, well, there's a few reasons why we want to do that, um, and depending on those reasons, there's different scenarios and different approaches that we need to, uh, to take. Um, the first one is to be able to add new and maybe complex views to my application. 
So maybe my application has certain views that are way too expensive to render right now. So it would be nice to have a specific data sets just to, uh, to supply the information for those complex views. Um, but it might also be the case that we have uh, cross-cutting concerns from separate components that we have to deal with, uh, such as uh, authentication or, um, or, or uh, authorization, maybe. Um, maybe we want to improve, improve modularity, uh, which allows us to deploy components separately, uh, which means that we have um, a different components now as a monolith, and we want to break them apart so that we can deploy them on different machines. Uh, and the last one is um, to solve performance problems that we have in a specific component. And the best way to solve a performance problem is to be able to isolate that component and make sure it has as little interactions with other components as possible so that we can uh, dive into uh, the, the specific problem um, and not be busy with uh, all this stuff that is, uh, is only weakly related. When answering those questions, I assume that an application is built in this um, um, in this layered architectural style, so that we have the user interface, which talks to a service layer, which talks to a data access layer, um, and uh, these modules have access to a domain model, which is used for the rendering as well as the storage, which is very common in uh, um, in applications nowadays. So let's go with the first scenario, which is to add a new view to an existing application. Now this existing application, we assume, does not use Axon yet. So we're going to introduce Axon and then uh, add a new view to that application based on the, uh, the Axon way of working. Step one is to define the optimal view, so the optimal data model, actually, for that specific view. So we need to find out what we want to render in that view and design the query model accordingly. So don't think about normalization here. Choose the level of normalization that matches the view. We've all been taught to use third normal form uh, and, and denormalize everything, uh, sorry, normalize everything. That's not uh, important right now. What's important right now is that we have a view that needs specific information. And we're going to create a, um, a data model that matches the exact way that information is rendered in the view. Um, the only reason why we want to normalize or demonormalize uh, more uh, than um, is absolutely necessary by the view is because we want to balance the update versus query performance. It might be that um, the best form of, uh, of denormalization for, for the view uh, has a very expensive update as a result. So we want to make sure that that's, uh, that's correctly balanced. Now that we have the view, the second step is to start raising events from the modules where relevant things happen. So we have to locate the services and entities where these things happen and then publish events from that, um, uh, that location. And the way to do that is to inject the event bus as a dependency to those modules and then publish domain events from those methods uh, where the relevant things happen. Now, in these events, make sure that you use sensible naming because these events right now might be useful to, uh, to build up the new view, but in the future, we're going to use these events as well for new views or, or even other, uh, to update other components. So, from a uh, domain-driven design perspective, these names have to make sense. Uh, they have to have a business uh, meaning. Once we have the events and we have our model, we can start creating a, uh, an event handling component. And that's the component that will um, handle all the events that we're publishing and update the query model accordingly. Um, so we have to create a new and separate component to hold the view model. Of course, if we don't build it in a separate component, we will not be able to distribute it later on. So make sure there's a separate component for it. And then we build the event handlers that update that model for each relevant event. So all these events are now uh, passed on the bus by the uh, components where they happen. 
Um, so we need to register the event handler with the event bus so that we get all the events uh, um, handled in there. And once you've done that, that's basically it. That's all we need to do to create a new uh, view model in an existing application. This is also the simplest scenario. The more complex scenario is when we want to isolate certain components. So we have an application that consists of a, a, a number of logical components um, and we want to isolate one of them to be able to deploy it in a separate uh, module, for example. So let's assume that we've got this domain model where um, a lot of entities are connected with each other uh, and basically every uh, entity is indirectly connected to any other entity in our model. Um, and then, so we have this huge um, yeah, monolithic uh, model. Of course, there's a service layer on top of it and we have a number of services that access these um, these entities in the domain model. And in most applications, there already is a certain amount of modularity. So we already know that certain uh, services uh, interact with a certain part of the model. Um, and if you ask any architect to design the system or to describe an existing system, this is the story we get. So there's a very clear separation. Okay, the order services are about orders. So they access the order part of our domain model, while the shipping part will um, interact with the shipping part of our domain model. Unfortunately, in practice, that's not really the case. In practice, we, uh, we see that the services also interact with entities that are linked to the entities that they should interact with, um, just because there's a, a very easy way to access them. So from an order, we can do get customer. And we We've got all the details about that customer, uh, but suddenly we are interacting with a customer entity from an order service. So even though we have a customer service as well, we indirectly or actually directly access um, these uh, entities, although they belong to another service. And whether or not we can isolate these components for the, uh, mainly depends on how entangled these um, uh, service calls are. So what we need to do is we look when we look at our domain model we need to untangle these classes and make sure that the uh, order and the user in this example uh, as well as the order item and the product they they are less coupled as they are right now. So right now you can see that the order is linked to a user um, for example using a, a hibernate mapping or something but the the user is directly accessible from the order. That's not something we should be doing. If we decide that they are separate parts and separate components of our uh, domain model, we should not directly link them. So what we can do instead is instead of using the user object in the order, we can just mention the customer ID. Just mention the identifier of the user. If you need access to the user itself, you can go to the user service and do whatever you think is necessary to interact with the user, and that way we've got um, we've got our model um, untangled, and now get our uh, services only access the components that they should be accessing. And we do the same for the order item, which refer to the product. But of course, we've got certain queries where you combine data from a customer and the order together to show that uh, that data. Well, you can always fetch the customer from the repository based on the ID that you get. Uh, so you can combine that information and then present it uh, to the user. And in certain cases, on the user interface, you have a situation where you want to combine the order and customer data. Um, so how do I deal with that? And that's exactly when you look at CQRS, that's exactly where the queue is for. So we separate the command and the query responsibilities because the query model is different from the command model. In the query model, we very often want to combine information from different aspects, whereas in the command model, we want to keep it as focused as possible. So that's why we really want different view models as well. So let's look at how this view model, what this view model could look like 
And on the right side of the screen, you see the order and the order item. And in green, there's the customer name and the customer address in the order. And there's an item name and a tax percentage in the order items. Now, these are attributes that, in a command model, do not directly belong to the order itself. Conceptually, an order belongs to a customer, and a customer has a name. But in this view model, we don't really care about that. What we care about is who has bought a specific item, and where do we need to ship it. Uh, so we store that information uh, directly in the order itself. And that one we do is we use events to update those models. Uh, so we have a, a query model updater component uh, or class that listens to specific events. In this example, the order created event, the order item added event, and the order confirmed event. And it updates the order and order item uh, accordingly. Now, of course, there's denormalized data in there, uh, the customer name and the customer address. So when an order is created, we have to look up the current address and the current name of the specific user, because probably the order created uh, event only contains the identifier of the user and not all the personal details that we might need. So what we do from the query model updater is we can we query the uh, user component and the product component for the relevant information and then combine that all into, uh, into the query model that we have. So we don't have to combine it on every query again and again, but we just combine it once when the order is created and then uh, store it uh, in our view model. Now, once we've done this, we might have untangled a small portion of our, um, uh, of our domain model. Um, and from here, it's an iterative and incremental process to, to extract all the query models that we have. So one by one, and of course, starting with the most important one, or the most, maybe the easiest one to get you going, and then move on quickly to the uh, most difficult one to make sure that what you're trying to do is a, is a feasible job. You extract all the query models from your application, one by one. And then what remains is basically your command model. Um, so now we can redesign that command model. We can throw away all the data that we don't need anymore. Um, and we just keep the data that we need to guard the invariants in our, um, in our application. For example, a customer name in a command model is hardly ever needed because the customer name is not part of any invariants. Um, so if, if the only thing we need to do is uh, throw an event when a name changed, we might not need the name to, um, uh, to do anything else. Of course, we want the name in, in the view, but then it's part of a view model. And the last thing we should do is use explicit command objects instead of direct calls because it gives us the location transparency that we need to be able to scale an application beyond a single uh, single machine. So if you want distribution, having explicit command objects makes the job a lot easier. So basically, that's, um, that concludes this, uh, this webinar. Um, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to, uh, to send me a message or get in contact with uh, Triumph for Amsterdam, and we'll uh, try to answer them uh, as best as we can. Thank you, and goodbye.